How did you get your first script in the hands of John Carpenter? Well, it was the first thing I, I wrote. I'd been working as a producer on indie films and, and music videos and commercials and was like, I'm going to take the leap into screenwriting. So I saved enough money for one year to just work on screenwriting and um, had this idea to do like a very Pulp Fiction type horror film, you know, and, and kind of nonlinear. And I had a friend who was a screenwriter, Sean Keller, who became my writing partner. And we'd never worked together. We just decided to write it. And just after three months of just working on the script with like, you know, no expectations, we ended up getting a manager from it because it was so unusual and odd and different than what was out there. And then from there, you know, I get a call a few weeks later that said, John Carpenter read it, loves it. So I grew up watching his movies. And by the way, he's the greatest guy on the face of the earth. He's the coolest dude you could ever meet. So he read the script, liked it, and was very interested in directing it. And his process was to sit there with the script and read it aloud to us, page by page. And everything that he didn't like or thought wasn't good, he'd just go, come on, you can do better than that, which was, which was a learning experience in itself. And it showed, it taught me a lot about what directors are looking for and what they want. And he was a great teacher. And the film never got made, but it was a really good experience. And then from that, we actually did an uncredited rewrite on his last film, uh, The Ward. So it, it worked out great because we got paid to, to rewrite the film. So we've worked with Carpenter twice, and he's a really good dude. And so this was the second script that you and your writing partner had. That was actually the first one. Oh, okay, sorry. But but how did you, how did this manager and how did all this even get in the hands of John Carpenter? Well, I had spent time, like the first 10 years of working in the film industry, I worked for production companies and produce some indie films and things. So I kind of knew how the business worked a little bit. I had an unfair advantage to most people just stepping in. But I spent 10 years working in the world and making some connections and also understanding how you know, scripts work. So I really had worked on a few things where I was like, I could probably write as well as that, you know, or even, you know, saw what other people were making and some other screenplays. I was like, I think I could do that. So that's kind of where it came out of. And just, you know, we, we also knew that we had to write something that was really unusual and out of the box. We didn't write a script to be made. We wrote a script to get noticed. And that's where I think really it worked. It was like, okay, this gets made, that's great, but people will not forget this script. And it did what it was supposed to do because it got us, you know, it got us a manager and then later it got us an agent from another script and just kept the ball rolling. And people still ask me about that script and we've optioned it, I don't know, maybe six or seven times in the last 15 years. Still hasn't been made, but it's, it's done well. And when you sat down with uh, John Carpenter, where was this, like an office building? Yeah, he has, I'm not going to say where his office is, sure, but sure, he, has yeah. a, uh, <laughs> yeah, he has an old craftsman. I think maybe he lived there like 20, 30 years ago. He still owns it. It's been converted into an office, so it's cool. You go in there and all his posters are up, all his scripts are there. You know, he just sits in the back office and... And just, you know, most of the time when we would talk about the script, we'd also talk about basketball and music and all these other things. and. He gave me a lot of advice about the film business. You know, he would say, you know, people are going to rip you off. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. Don't start writing until you get paid. You know, do this and that. And one of the best stories I have about him is when we were doing a, a rewrite on the ward for him. There was a big conference call with all these producers and everybody kept telling us what to do. And he stopped everyone. And he just said, hey, let, let them go do what they do. And it was the coolest thing because we knew all we had to do was just talk to Carpenter. You know, it's like, well, deal with everybody else and pretty much the script the rewrite we did was the movie that that you saw so yeah and when he started going through the script and saying you can do better than that did he did he show you what better was within the script no he no he's he let you he kind of treated you as a, as a professional it's like this can be better which means you need to go figure out how to make it better you know, and just some lines, he'd be like, you know, a hero would never say that. The lead of the movie wouldn't say that. You know, so it was a good, good, you know, education and understanding that, like, they're not going to do the work for me on things I didn't do correctly in the script. It's like, you know, and, and that's not necessarily their job. It's like, this isn't working. So you need to give me option A, B, and C. So that was a really good lesson, you know, from somebody who knows films backwards and forwards. And so when you and Sean left there with your, whether you put paper clips or post-it notes or whatever, 
how are you racking your brain to go, why didn't he like this? What, you know, like, what no, was that like? No, it was just like, I can't believe we're hanging out with John Carpenter oh. more, more than anything. <laughs> but, but he was so, he's, he's like, like, he's probably one of the best people I've ever met, not just in the film business, but just a great, great person and, and super cool and just, you know, gives great advice. And it was just, he didn't do it because he was, you know, from a place of like, come on. It was more like, you can do better. And he would say, you can do better just you know was really pushing and and really dug the script and you know to have somebody who you watched his movies growing up say that is like you better listen you know so it was part it was it was part of educating yourself i still i've been doing this 15 years professionally as a screenwriter i'm trying to educate myself all the time to get better every day so good lesson and jim were you paid for the script no that one was just work to try to get it to the finish line that happens sometimes Sometimes things are options, sometimes they're not. If you're, you have a good attachment, like a director like him, you know, you sometimes work on trying to get to the next level to go out to get the financing. So not every job, you know, or every, every project you work on is, you know, you're not always getting paid. Sometimes you have, to, you have to make that decision. Do you want to do the work to try to get to the next level or do you want to try to get paid? You know, and sometimes there's no one's going to pay you. So it's like there's... It's either the market doesn't want it right now or will want it with attachments or, you know, it's a tricky thing. Most people in the film business, you won't make money unless multiple people want to buy the project. If just one person wants to make it, they're like, sure, we'll give you an option. We'll do this. Um, we may have optioned that script. I don't really remember, but it wasn't, you know, it was never purchased. So, and a lot of times you just get an option. You don't get paid for a script. You read these stories of people, you know, selling a script here or there. That happens. But if you're more in the indie world, 10 million and under, you option a script. Maybe they'll give you five grand. Maybe they'll give you 10 grand. Maybe they'll give you a hundred dollars. And when the movie gets made, the first day of shootings, when they actually pay for the script. So if you want to be a team player and get the movie made, you have to work a lot for free. And so going there, you and Sean both knew we're not going to be paid, but we see the opportunity exactly. down the line. And exactly. It was like having a master class. It's like, you know, it's yeah, where the guy's sitting there, you can ask him anything you want. So yeah, it's great. What's the story behind your first screenplay sale? So first screenplay sale was the script we wrote after the John Carpenter project, which was called Ellie Gothic. This was called Damned. And this script was got out and it was picked up by a pretty big producer. And they arranged the financing for the film and they actually paid for the script. And what happened was a few days before shooting, it was fully cast. Um, I think they were shooting on like a Monday and this was Friday. The cast was getting on plane flights to fly out to Missouri and they get these frantic calls like, don't get on the plane because the money fell out three days before principal photography. And that happens sometimes in films until you're actually, I even have the theory that on an indie film until you're actually finished shooting, you don't, that's when you don't really have to worry about the money so much. You have to worry about it post, but I've worked on films where sometimes they don't have all the money they say they, they do. So it's a problem that happens, but you know, it was, it was sad. We got paid at least, you know, we got the rights to the script back. They were great to give us that back because the movie didn't get made and we optioned it several more times, but it was, you know, it was very disappointing because that was the first thing I thought was going to get made and it didn't, it got very close and it just fell apart. But you know, you live and you learn and then you move on to the next project, keep going. So that didn't deter you? No, not at all. No, it was, it was it actually made me think even more, okay, we gotta work even harder on the next project and, and get something made because it came so close. And finally we're making some money as screenwriters and, and we were like, let's do it. It's not, you know, no, actually, it actually emboldened me to even go harder and things. And so in a case like that, who calls the the actors the location is that the producer that's yeah, probably making the all producer. these horrible yeah. calls it's probably going to be very difficult yeah and so there was no chance of maybe in a month it was basically this is done they they talked about it but usually in these kind of projects if that happens it's it's kind of hard to regroup you spend so many months putting the whole team together doing everything getting the actors in line you know getting their schedules making deals and then for it all to go sideways and not know when you're going to pick it back up it's very difficult. It does happen, don't get me wrong, but it's, it becomes like, okay, you know, there's a little bit of a, a jinx on a project at that point. So you just kind of have to move on and, and just try to make the next one. And sorry, this was your first screenplay that you wrote? Or you had second. written pre- Oh, second, second. okay, with yeah. Sean? Yeah, Okay. One. And the, with the first one, 
Um, did, did you expect anything from that? That was the John Carpenter one? You know, the expectations were just to get noticed, really. Because it was it was really kind of crazy. And and that's another thing I talk to people a lot about. It's like, you know, what are your expectations with the script? Is it, you know, if you write something to sell it or to get it made or to get noticed? And a lot of, I think, young screenwriters don't try to write something to get noticed. You know, because if you want to do this for a living, it's something that you've got to like, you're not just going to write one script. You're going to be writing every day all the time and have tons of scripts. Do you think the chain of events would have happened today because things have changed so rapidly in so many ways? Do you think that same story could be duplicated again? Either one, whether you get a script that you know you won't be paid for, but into the hands of some master class oh, person, de- basically, oh, a master. Definitely. It happens all the time. Oh, it a does. Lot, okay. A lot of people who become big writers, um, they, they write a script that turns into a sample. And even I've had that several times in my career where there's like a sample of like a horror film that everybody was into and then a thriller that everybody was into. And then uh, recently wrote a really big action film that that's getting a lot of uh, traction right now. But it's also just in the last few weeks got me up for some big writing gigs because, you know, if, the, if you're trying to get a job for an 80 million dollar action film, you can't show them a one million dollar horror film. You have to have that sample that gets people's attention. And you know, professional high level producers read these, they know by your sample if you can do the other job. So you know, you have to have samples that fit that that kind of what you're the type of work you're looking for. So it was a great sample. So 